Sherry Arjun, Sherry Moon the Park, Iranian, came from Iran, the land of Zarathustra. At that time, it was considered a very sacred land by the Zoroasters. Now, when Islam came, the, the Islamic people started persecuting and treating the people of Iran horribly, even just killing them and torturing them and so on and so forth. Then uh, Sherry Arjun's father was a very, very poor man. So he worked at the Parsi Tower of Silence. And at the Parsi Tower of Silence, he made enough money to supply for his family. Well, unfortunately, Sherry Arjun's mother died at the age of five years old. Very, very young. And he went to help his father at the Parsi Tower of Silence. And uh, he didn't go to school because they didn't have the means for him to go to school. And uh, he worked there until he, he was 12 years old. And at that time, he became, after seeing all the dead bodies and, and that goes on the Parsi Tower of Silence, uh, because the vultures come and eat the flesh. That's a part of the culture. Uh, he, he was not horrified. Like, at first, at first, he became like really, really a fearless person. And to himself, within himself, he felt that if there was anything of any substance in the world was God. And at that point in time, they called him Yastam. So at the age of 12, he told his father goodbye, mother died at five, and him and his brother, he became a, a wandering uh, mystic. And after eight years, a Sufi. And uh, him and his brother decided to go to uh, to leave for India because of the persecutions and the mistreatments by the Mohammedans. So he boarded uh, a ship uh, from Kuramshar, which is a port in Iran, all the way into Mumbai. The, uh, at that time in Iran, they lived in a narrow country, but at the same time there were beautiful deserts oasis says, and beautiful crops and vegetation and tremendous amounts of flower in these places that were fertile, such as the oasis. Now, he decided, along with his brother, that he would, they would uh, travel to, uh, from Kuramshar to Mumbai. At the age of 20, they left. In Iran, from the early days when he became a wandering uh, uh, dervish, he was declared a Sufi. Sufi, because of his knowledge that came through his intellect and the heart that started to develop extremely fast because he just repeated yes, then, yes, then, yes, then, yes, then, yes, then. Throughout the whole entire day, even sometimes, as he fell asleep, he would dream of Yastan's name only. So, in Iran, he went to uh, Shantabrisa Samadhi, uh, Jalal uh, Rumi, uh, and uh, quite a few other places where all the saints and uh, perfect masters um, live. Well, Merwan, when he was a child, he never called his father Sheriar from a very early age. A very lovingly and very affectionate, he called him uh, Bobo. That was his father's name. Now, when he was in, uh, in Iran and traveled to these places, uh, he went to Shams Tabriz's tomb, uh, Omar Karian, Jalalin and Rumi. Uh, and many, many other saints. 
So Sherry Archie was born on May 21st, uh, 1853. I goofed up the good interview by reading something else. In any case, that's okay. It'll come out perfect at the end. So no school in Fort Ham. Uh, and uh, at the age of 12, he told his father uh, goodbye. And uh, his brother's name was Kuda. And in India, his brother and Sherry Ergy found employment at a tea shop. Now, they worked there for some time, and then the, the tea shop owner didn't like the way that uh, he wore his Zoroastrian robe. And uh, so with his savings, he bought himself a begging bowl and a staff. And uh, his job only lasted for five months. So he decided to travel into Karachi, Pakistan. And uh, so, he, and then he came back from Pakistan and he traveled around India for over 10 years. Uh, and wherever he went to, he would uh, take the name of Yes and Yes and Yes. And uh, eventually, sometimes he, was, he grew so weak that he would fade it and he would uh, collapse by lack of sleep. But one time when he fell asleep uh, in his slumber, uh, he saw a man and a boy and they gave him water and then they walked away from him. He was grateful because he was in the desert lands and the old man and the boy disappeared, and then they reappeared, and they asked, where did you come from? Uh, the old man walked uh, this way and bowed down to him, and he raised his head, because there is no one there, and these people were agents or perfect masters from God. Then he went to Gujarat. And for 18 years, he searched for the perfect master, perfect master, and he couldn't find any. So he decided, well, this is really too much for me, so I'm going to do the chila. The chila means that you sit around the circle for 40 days. And after 40 days, uh, you get your wish or uh, you attain God realization. So after a little bit of time, without moving, eating, or sleeping too much, uh, he started to have visions. Visions of great white tigers trying to get into the circle and attacking him. Visions of flames that would come out of the earth and try to burn his body to death. Visions of ghostly figures and all kinds of uh, calamitous type of uh, uh, deities that appear trying to get rid of him out of the circle. So he lasted for 30 days. He couldn't take it no more. And uh, the last days of the chilla, uh, he was so overwhelmed by all that transpired during the chilla that he just uh, collapsed outside of the circle. He became unconscious walked to the river, and he collapsed again. And then when he came out of his slumber, he heard the voice, and the boys said verbatim, as Mary Baba said, your son, it is not your son. It is your son who will attain uh, everything that you seek. So Sherry came out of his slumber and headed towards Pune. In a uh, long way, and uh, he just continued to travel and travel throughout India until he arrived at Pune. And in Pune, he had a sister named Piroja. And then when he saw his sister, they both became very emotional, they started crying because he had not seen her since, uh, uh, since he was a five-year-old child. 
And then the sister Piroja always insisted that Sherry Art should become a, a household. At that time, I believe it was 38 years old. Uh, I'll go through it. It should be 38. And he just didn't have any interest. He just wanted to become, uh, to continue his life of a dervish. But staying at the sister's home, she insisted thoroughly and inside and out that he should get married. So he was thinking, how am I going to get out of this uh, uh uh, uh, this problem because I don't want to get married. So he thought one day, because there was a uh, a lady that had a daughter, Shireen, and she was a friend of Biroja's. And uh, he says, yes, I will marry that child at five. Well, it was a preposterous uh, uh, thing to say that a two year a thirty eight year old man is going to uh, is going to marry a five year old but the the mother of the child she felt that uh, maybe it's not such a good idea uh, maybe it's not a bad idea she'll grow up and find somebody else so they made an agreement with Piroja that it would be okay and in those days the rallies were people of honor, not like today or many other ages. They honor their word as if they were saying, yes, then I promise you I will do that, who was going to break their word to God. But they, underlying that, they had their own motivations for saying that. Anyhow, in that agreement, uh, he the, the, the Shireen started growing up. And sometimes Sherry Archie would go, she was affectionate looking at towards the child, and he and he felt that maybe I'll bring a little doll, a flower another time, or something very affectionately. And uh, looking at her as as if she had had a daughter. So the uh, Shireen became really happy and excited to see Sherry Archie. So she would run over to the school and blabber all over the place to her friends what this man had done uh, for her. Showed her the few little things that uh, he gave her and, uh, and the other kids were really, really happy. But at the same time, Shireen started growing up very, very fond of his so-called admirer. And eventually, it became the time that uh, the marriage took place, because they became fond of each other. Not so much Sherry Art, but she did. Okay, so then one time he gave her a silver ring and a little letter, and this is what impressed the, the the, the girls the most. So now that he was 39 years old, he decided to go out and become a householder. So she started, he started being a gardener. And he was really, really good with uh, gardening because it's sort of like some saint would talk to the plants and they would grow up properly and so on and so forth. And he saved some money. And with that money, him and his brother Kodad opened up a tea shop. Eventually they owned several tea shops. And the original tea shop is over by KLM Hospital in Pune. He's st still a little restaurant throughout today. And anyhow, uh, he had a, uh, with the savings that he got from the tea shops, he decided that it was going to be time to raise a family. So he went over by Meher de Stura, as it is known today, and bought what is called the Pumpkin House. And that's where he lived. After some, it, it was the, the name of the house was Bobla at the time, not the Pumpkin House. And after some time, he, Shireen started having children, children after children. 
So she bore nine children. And that was quite a few children for, but typical of India and some other countries uh, uh, for those times, like Mexico still something today. And uh, so anyhow, eventually uh, he bought Mayor Baba House, which sits right, uh, uh, right across. So, so they had uh, different names for the kids, and she had a habit of calling Marijuana Shiro. And, uh, and Bubble, uh, and, and uh, Marilyn, as Moreau spoke, uh, extremely good Gujarati without having to go to Gujarat. So Marilyn was the second song, or the, the second time, and Shreem Mog, uh, his other brother John Shed that uh, that uh, for certain things and to look after Marwan as long as, as well as his brother John. And by the time Shireen was pregnant, she was having really beautiful dreams and and she got into a happy, blissful type of a state, as she, as Merwan was in her belly, and then after that, after he was born, so she looked after him more so than the rest of the other kids, including Sherry Arjun, and she had mystical experience also at the same time, so she felt uh, that uh, uh, that. Uh, Everything will be fine. Now, Baba's elder sister, his name was Freni, and she died in an epidemic. Uh, and Jal Baramanati, uh, and the last one born was Manju, uh, and two other other children died also, uh, seven months and seven years. So Bobo and Marog. Shariaji felt that this was a child which her, that he had heard that the divine voice, Shariaji felt that it was Yestan talking to him about marijuana. So he eventually put a big photo of Mer Baba as marijuana in his house. And, uh, and the marijuana spoke Persian, Arabic, and Gujarati, and, uh, and the same with his father. And his father thought that he was a gift from God, his gift from God. Uh, the toy shop closed late at night. And Mayor Baba was, uh, I'd known as marijuana at the time, work at the toy shop. Uh, Eventually, Sherry Andrew turned 70 years old, and, and uh, one of his business associates that he owned the toy shops, he, uh, he manipulated, and manipulated and stole the business from Sherry Andrew. And instead of Sherry Andrew reacting as a normal human being would, like myself, he uh, he gave kind-hearted forgiveness to his partner. Uh, so in the year of 1932, uh, Shiriarji passed away, taking the name of uh, uh, Yestan in his in, in his lips, and Mayor Baba said. Bobo's death was not like a regular sleep. He was emanciated uh, and given. And 
but he was searching for that realization. So anyhow, now Shireen told some of the stories. The Mirabama story and his family is really fabulous because still we got to go into Jal and Baram and uh, Mani and uh, and whoever was left, which I'll start going by one. So, uh, in any case, uh, Shireen would say some of the things that transpired in her life with marijuana. Marijuana would go outside of the house because they never, were, you know, the pumpkin house and bottles houses. Uh, he would go out and play. And in those days in Kuna, there would be like incredible herds of buffaloes running around. With owners, non owners, loose animals, and so on and so forth. And one day, Mayor Baba was sitting in the middle of Merida Store Road, as it is called today, and uh, there was a, a nest stampede of hundreds of buffaloes coming his way. And Shireen tried to save Merwan, but it was impossible. She couldn't cross because the stampede of buffaloes came getting closer and closer and closer. And then when they got close to Meribaba, they went in two directions like this and left them like in the middle of a noble or a shape or a circle type of a shape. So he wasn't skating. Also, there were many instances where he played with cobras, and Shireen was petrified, and but nothing ever happened. He, you know, even sometimes he'd be nicely talking to the cobras and so on, um, and so on and so forth. Because God was, or Merwan at that point, was very uh, uh, inside of him. As I relate the story. He had a very spiritual inside. He didn't know what the time was and all that. But in any case, he said their brother that was alive was Zhang Shen. Well, Zhang Shen died at an early age in one of Baba's going around. And instead of, and the Mongoli got the news. So Baba knew the news already. Yeah, he, now he is Mayor Baba now. And uh, instead of grieving or saying something about uh, uh, Junction, Baba decided it was going to be a very auspicious occasion. That they should get sweets and a nice dinner and, and lots of musical instruments to brought in and to be played this music and the music. The mother couldn't understand this. So what transpired was that Merbaba told them, John Shed has finally come to me. So that was uh, the other brother of uh, Merbaba. Now, John. First, we'll start with Baram, which was the second oldest. Baram. Uh, was very lovingly, knowingly, that his brother was God in human form. He had no doubts like John. And he went with him in certain uh, travels when Elizabeth Patterson and Katie and Marina and this Westerners went up there to be with Baba. And he always wore very nice attire, a little shirt and tie, you know, the nice pants and so on and so forth. And how he earned his money was that he would uh, create like little bracelets with Mirabala's uh, uh, bangles running from the bangle, you know, and, and necklaces and rings. But he always took them to Mirabala, so Baba would have the blessing put on them, so Baba laid his hand on whatever he brought and he did it. And one day there was a whole box of photographs of Mirabala that were bought to Baron. Took him to Baba and Baba placed his hand on the photograph on the top and he said, these are going to be distributed to each and every household 
that loves Mary Baba, one per family. They're not to be sold or anything like that. So that happened. And at the time, everybody had their picture of Mary Baba that was blessed by uh, that. So Abraham eventually, with age, you know, very happily joined Mary Baba. Now here's Brother John. He was a real skeptic. He could not accept that he was, his brother claimed to be caught in human form. And he just followed him everywhere to see what he was doing and all of that, trying to declare him that his brother is not really what he says he is, but it's some kind of a nice mystic or something to that effect. So she read my used to pay him a little bit of money because Baba would disappear at the night times at that point in time to Jungle Maharaj's cave, which was an ancient cave to Lord Shiva. And in it there had been all hand carved of the cave. And on the inside there was a big circumference of cave and nicely kind of rocky polish type. And uh, then uh, Amir Baba would go there during the night. During the days, he attended school and he went to take Baba Jan Starshan and, and until she revealed him who he was. So he also really loved uh, Baba Jan. Baba Jan had already settled in Kuna from Baluchistan, which he came from originally. And uh, then uh, he followed Mer Baba, uh, John, on his bicycle because he got a few coins to inform his mother as to the whereabouts of marijuana. So he always brought the news. And then marijuana also go, used to go to the Tower of Silence. And at night time, you sit outside and sometimes stare at the moon. And that's what he would do, so Mother had to know because uh, Merwin was not acting very rational at this time. He had very unusual habits. And he went, when he went to, when he used to go to Jungle Maharaj's cave, he would sit in at the cave and uh, he would take uh, the different names of God. So, Joel the student says, I mean, Jolly Run. And then he was really, really skeptic. And everybody in his family uh, was convinced that Mary Baba had become the avatar of the age as Baba John kissed him on the forehead. And as his brother Joel uh, explains that he was a really skeptic, so one day they were in uh, a hut and there was a fire burning. And Baba told Jao, Jao, give me a coal. So with this thing like this, he picks up a coal and gives it to Mary Baba with, with a thing like tweezers or something with big ones. And says, extend out your hand. And Baba put that coal in his hand and he Burn him through and through, but Joel didn't feel anything. And then Baba himself got rid of the cold, and that's where he fainted with pain. So again, he, I mean, then he went to the Mary Sassoon Hospital, and uh, in Mary Sassoon Hospital, uh, the only time that he felt any relief is when Mary Baba would come and visit him. And that gave him the conviction that Mary Baba was God in human form, his brother. And eventually, in some year in the 80s, I saw uh, him just maybe a month prior to his demise. Because with Joel, I had nothing but a lot of fun, as well as with a lot of people. Uh, because he would write us letters. He would wanted to know who was coming to 
and yell. And then he would write letters to that person. And all of a sudden, everybody gets a letter from Joe, oh, many people. And he would ask for some items to be brought to him. And such as film, you know, the Kodak films, and just little items, you know, no cameras, nothing of any big expense or anything, but little items. And a lot of people resented this because they thought he was just trying to get something from them. And what Joel did, since film was very precious in India, he would sell the the film and would give that monies that came from the films to the poor people and the destitute. That's what he wanted that film for, not for his own ends, because he needed nothing. And part of everything with Joel, like when I met him at the Mir Hotel in the early 70s, my God, he was just so full of humor. He, I'm most familiar with Joel, more than Baron. And uh, he was just so happy to see one. And he used to tell everybody, go to the Amir Hotel before he shifted you to the to the Parsi Hotel right across from the railway station, two, three blocks distance from each other, little shops and stuff like that. Because at the Parsi Hotel, you would get all his buddies. And they would gather around and maybe steam with them and they can sit with you and TV chat and all that. But the, the Amir Hotel was the gathering place because it was a Parsi, not a Parsi, but uh, a very well known hotel by the train station. So everybody landed at the Amir, including myself. I'll never forget the first time that I saw Dow. I'm sitting right outside, I'm sitting on the Amir Hotel looking for someone to walk through the door. And then I see like a rickshaw that pulls up to the front and I see Joel's feet come out. Half of his, uh, up to a little bit more than the knee, he was stepping out of that uh, rickshaw and uh, I see like black little Parsi type of shoes and a white uh, pair of pants, you know, not American made with Indian style, and then he says that he comes in full bloom. And I almost celebrated with happiness because he was so short and I did not know what he looked like at that point in time, but there was something about him that I knew that this was Mary Baba's brother, how certainly was. So he took me all around Pune at the point in time. There was other, not only me, other groups of people. Whenever he, he, Joel was in Pune, he would take individually by himself to, to, to the Parsi Tower of Silence, to, to the zoo, to see Baal's elephants of Mitra, the elephant with big, beautiful, shiny eyes, and she would, uh, and he, Joel would tell you to buy bananas to give her as prasad. And then the elephant would go, row, 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 when he saw you coming at a distance, and he stood like in two legs. Incredible, but he did. And then when you arrived there, he went down and with his trunk took your darshan. Well, that was Baba's elephant. And her name was Sumitra. But you talk about eyes that I never seen, including any human being, except a few beautiful eyes like Sumitra. They were just shine. And Bao would go especially to the zoo to be and spend time with Sumitra. And she loved Mary Baba, and Mary Baba loved her. Sumitra died quite some time, so it was a big procession. And Pune, and they put him in the back of a big uh, like trailer truck and full of gardens and so on and so forth. And then she became queen again. In any case, that was the story of Sumitra. And uh, then went to the Seven Heaven Days and so many restaurants and it took you all over the place, you know, MG Road and told you where shops about would go to and in uh, many events of their Bible's life. But his humor was matchless. Matchless, matchless, matchless. One time 
He says, Tony, I have to go meet a group of uh, uh, Australians that are coming. I says, may I come with you? Sure, why not? So we went to meet the Australians at the Emir Hotel. Well, these people in Australia have a habit of drinking beer or liquors. So they all, they were kind of tense because that's a group that was their first time to India. And then he started having the drinks and Joel encouraged him, yeah, drink some more, drink some more, be merry, be happy, enjoy it, enjoy it, enjoy it. And everybody turned very joyful. And so they say they couldn't even feel the steps that took you up that room on the first floor of the near hotel. It is said that. Because the Australians became overwhelmed on the happy. Manager. That's the younger brother of my father. Well, as a child, from the very early age, uh, she went to Catholic school in uh, St. Mary's or St. Joseph, Joseph's, I forgot which one, a Catholic school. And she always wanted to live with Mary Baba. I mean, Mary Baba. And she loved Mary Baba, Mary Baba, Mary Baba. And that was her long game to go live with Mary. Baba. And many things happened to her during, uh, she had, not, it's not even called convection that Mayor Baba was got. It's far beyond that. A love incomprehensible to most of humanity except for Mera. And Mera was beyond that. So you can't imagine how the longing to be with her brother. And eventually she joined Mayor Baba, the teenager, and she went to live with him and travel around with him where he went to. And she was one of the lucky ones to go in uh, the new life because there were four people that were in the new life. One of them was Mera, Mari, Dr. Goher, and I think the other one was Nadja. I'm not sure about that yet, but that's the way it was in the new life. So her life became true to live as God's sister. She was also very humorous, but she spoke better English than anybody that I've ever heard in my life. And she spoke it without an English accent. And she related the many, many events that transpired in Mary Baba's life along with the women, things that happened to Mary Baba, as well as many beautiful dreams that she had. Oh my God, she would dream about Baba. Like one time, you know, that, you know, there was a, a herd of white deer in this different forest, you know, and Mary Baba was sitting there under a tree and he had a big crown on his face. And he was like surreal because all the, Little fawns came and, uh, you know, the deers came and they were white deer to get Tarshan and all the trees bowed down their leaves to him and, and all these incredible things that she happened to have. So she meant, had lots and lots of beautiful dreams. I mean, she was a dreamer. That was her love for her brother. Much less of all sorts. Uh, because when I met Baba's nephews and Mother Purina, I read in my read in that story before, you know, my son from the West has come home and we you know, understand this. And as soon as I saw the twins, and they called me the triplet. And we became basically inseparable. That's basically what transpired with me and their Baba family, whoever was there. And then, uh, uh, that was basically money. She traveled in new life, you know, with Mary Baba all the way to the end. She eventually passed away in the 1980s. And I remember the last time I used to go for different embraces. I stand in line if there was a line of people, or I asked, somebody would come and give me an embrace, and sometimes I stand up in line and get another embrace before we left. 
this time there was a lot of people in there outside. And I went over and I embraced money. And then again, I went back to the back of the line for my second embrace. And when I arrived to money, she says, Tony, did I just embrace you? What are you doing in front of me for another embrace? Can't you see the masses of people that are coming? And I got to embrace every one of them. Okay. So she didn't give me an embrace. But eventually she passed away just several months later, you know, as usual, at the Kuna Club, you know, where they went through the last rites and ceremonies and so on and so forth. And uh, uh, she was telling me, there's a whole world waiting for and you had so many embraces from me, why do you need one more? Those who have never embraced me or don't know anything about me, or those who are new to Baba, those are, they need my embrace for you. In any case, then there was a sister, Kulmar, she was really a beautiful, beautiful lady, Baba's niece. And there was a fella named Jango. At the time, Bulldog was to be married. So they brought people to see Mayor Baba for approval or disapproval, because Baba was the king of the kings. And Baba approved and approved and approved that these Baba lovers and disapproved and disapproved and disapproved. And disapproved. They're all disapproved, really. And then one thing, a guy named Jagan here, or Jango, he was not even a Baba lover. His father told him, now we're going to go see Mary Baba. And see what he says. He's always been refusing people, so probably next. So when Baba saw Jango, and the father asked for marriage to Gunnar. Baba looked at his hand and he says, he's the diamond in my ring. He just shines everywhere. Oh my God. So Jango stayed there until she passed away. As long as Gunnar too. And I used to go see periodically, or most of the time, I stay in Pune all the time so I can enjoy the, the sights and most of all the food. The hypocritical about it. I loved it. the food in Pune because I got tired of it and I care about food. In any case, then Gulna had a daughter and she married Dr. Arvin Chopra, which is a resident in Baba's house until today. And Gunnar's daughter was Mernas. So they still live. Then came Chiruji. Oh, he was very aloof. He liked only a very few people, like the fellow that wrote the Divan de Hadis in English from Australia, David Nordin, myself, and, but very few others. Me and him became inseparable. I used to stay there just so I could. Smoked tons of charming hours with Cheru because I used to buy them by the box. And we traveled everywhere around there because he, I had the privilege to be with him because he didn't take anybody else anywhere. Maybe Paul, the guy that wrote the Divine the Hafiz. But um, other than that, he would just sit there and charming and charming and charming and charming. We greet when you go inside and say, Jay Baba, and that's it, you know? Welcome to Baba's house. And that was the end of his conversation with most people. But you say, but there's ones that he really liked, you know? And so, I don't know, he took me to to the racetrack and the Seven Heaven restaurant and another one that used to be there, right behind MG Road, and some like some very fancy name by, for Paradise, you know? But Farsi and, uh, and like that, we spend all the things until uh, and I 
went to see Dr. James Miller, saved a bunch of money to send him money to last him for the rest of his life, and uh, for his charming house, not for anything else, because he liked to go around and have this tea with all the Parsis, chitty chitty chat and chitty chitty chat, and they would sit. Used to they smoke beanies or charming hearts, either one, because they were affordable for them. In any case, he was a fabulous individual because his sense of humor and that. So money. I can't think of anything else, another Korean, I think he was a, related to Mira somewhere. I don't quite remember now. But that's the essence of most of them. And uh, and they, they lived all a fabulous life. And then when time was to Montserrat, when they lived at Greg's Terrace, they had two best friends, Billy Gemini Edwards. Oh, they were inseparable. And all loved Mayor Baba, dear Mayor Baba, the top of the line. Best. And Roost and Montserrat were two hefty dudes. A few stories about them. So, when anybody was picking on anybody else in school, the bullies or whatever, Roost and Montserrat interfered. And then the fights started, and Roost and Montserrat being so big and joined by big, big generics, would fight all these people. The whole day like Saturday. One day, Bob says, What did you do in school? Oh, Baba, this, Baba, that, you know. And Baba said, Don't you get in any fights anymore whatsoever. Never fight again unless you are at first place. And Clarence fell, Well, we're so big, nothing is going to happen. So one time, B. Geminarich and Ruth and Montserrat in school, they, they saw their change in him, that they became so docile, no pick and fight, so on and so forth, you know. These are stories that nobody knows us when we name all this. Uh, and they went to push Ruth and Montserrat, you know, physically push them. And now Baba says, unless you are in Intimidated so bad, you're gonna fight back from these guys. You know, like that. I did for the last time in my life, so I beat the holy daylights out of all the schoolboys that were beginning to bully him. And uh, me, Jamon Eroch, and, and Bruce and Montserrat just were beating the holy hell out of everybody. Me, Jamon Eroch are not that big, they're still alive. As well as the twins. And they say that because of me, you know, they they met all this uh uh that that Mary Rose, they had two children, and Mary Dill, they become to to Sharnas, and Shireen and Mary Dill well, and, and the other one that lives with the Navy of Selena. So in any case, that's what transpired in uh in what I basically uh, and the great relationship that continues until today with me and Baba's nephews, and we went to Mexico. And there's one story about the Mexican business, is that uh, one time, uh, at that time, I had gone to New Mexico, and I became very fond of Indian jewelry. I didn't know anything about but I would pass the Bajo land and Sunni land, the land of the Mexico Indians. And I started buying jewelry and I noticed that it would sell and sell and sell and whatever I had is sold by the tons. At that time, silver is three dollars a month. I'm in Myrtle Beach, year uh, about in the 70s. And I noticed one thing that transpires. Out of the clear blue sky, I collect kilograms of Sunni jewelry and rings and bracelets and my concho belt because it was really a far out and 
lucrative business. I was even adopted by the chief of the Sunni Indians because I brought Indian jewelry to Morro Beach, for example, to the southern parts of the U.S. and people had never seen it before. The price of silver shoots up to $23 an ounce for three overnight. And one time I'm at Grace Terrace, and I says, well, most of us are about you to know, do the most thing in your life. And uh, they said to me, we would like to go to Disney World and see Goofy and Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck and Daisy. That was their mentality at that time, like two little children with a little dog. Uh, and Bicha Manero, Chinchana, Samparvi, oh my gosh, you know what a trip. In any case, the price of silver overnight shoots up to $23. And I'm looking at my collection, that's taken me three or four years, maybe a tenth of all the money that I've made, a ton of it. And I said, shit, maybe I can fulfill the twin springs. So I went to the shops in here in Myrtle Beach. This is early 70s, hours. no, early 80s. And uh, I sell all my collection. I clean myself out except maybe a couple of rings and a bracelet and a watch band, you know. And without money, I send money a telegram. I, I mean, a, a letter. I have that letter of her reply which says, my dearest Tony, I wanted to thank you so much for your letter. This is the seventh day, so I decided not to read your letter until I took it uh, of Mayor Bowson to my seventh day. Uh, and uh, they used to do that once a month. Oh, Mayor, I mean, everybody was alive. And I placed it at their Bahas room in the tomb. And then I came back and I read your letter. She says, I'm so overwhelmed by your loving invitation that uh, you will finance Rustam and Surat's first journey to the West to see what they want to see, take them around so they can meet America and get familiar with the Westerners because they don't know any Westerners. And who did they know? Nobody. They were pretty much aloof with Beach and an And uh, in any case, their dream came true. We made a whole tour of the United States of America. And the first place that we went to was New York, where Hugh Rosenthal comes to New York. Uh, we went to to the credit card machine. The twins never seen a credit card machine. They used to take a credit card and boom. And first of all, they wanted to hear the noise of New York. So we're driving in the car from the airport. I see them both from the second floor. Oh, gee, baba, gee, baba. And uh, no, I just say, baba, karachi, baba, karachi, karachi, baba. And then they, they, they turned the windows rolled down. And then uh, the funniest things that we went to McDonald's driving window. They had never seen a driving window in their life. And we had a fabulous tour all the way in America. Sharna Samperby. The twins were engaged. One of them lived in Pune, which was Parveen, and Sharna's lived in Bombay. The twins had Two girls that were Baba lovers, kind of, but they really like Rustam and Saran. And uh, so Mani is very concerned about this thing. These guys are senseless, they don't want to go to school, all they do is uh, go from job to job, they don't want to work or anything, all they want to do is have fun. Have a bunch of cigarettes a day and drink tea and have fun, go visit this one and the other one. My nephews are useless. And she's complaining to Mayor Baba about this. And he says, How are they going to get married, Baba? And how are they going to support the family? And Baba looked at money and says, 
I will see to everything. They have the permission. When Baba says that a few days after, Sharnas and Parveen are in their night sleep. And what do they both dream at the same time? Real. This is story, says the one they said. Is that they dream that Mary Baba walks into their room and goes to their bed, lifts up their, their bed, their head, and they're taking their nap and Baba's uh, lap and Baba's caressing and caressing and caressing. Uh, they had the same dream at the same time. My God, and they don't know how to tell the twins because this means that Baba came to them in a dream, you know. We are the twins of Baba physically, I in Mexico. That's another story. Because me and the twins are just thousands of stories. That was just really you know, one more story about Baba's nephew. But Baba had approved of the marriage and he said that he would see to everything. Especially with Shiru. Because when he started complaining about Shiru, he was ten times more useless than the twins. Baba, this guy goes and work, he just likes to sit in Baba's house, he smokes all day long, chiming out after chiming out, he goes to his and Baba says, stop. Because money, you don't know what kind of heart you root 